From Hank Pym to Scott Lang, Goliath to Yellow Jacket, Marvel's size-shifting superhero has undergone a lot of changes over the years, but no matter who's wearing the helmet or what they call themselves, the astonishing Ant-Man and his successors have become a mainstay of the Marvel Universe. I'm Andrew, and on this episode of Yellow Spandex, we're looking at the evolution of Ant-Man's costume. We start, as always, with the comics, where Dr. Hank Pym first appeared not as a superhero, but simply as the man in the anthill. Before Marvel went all in on capes and costumes, they also published a ton of sci-fi and horror anthology series, like Strange Tales, Tales of Suspense, Tales to Astonish, and other books, I'm sure, that didn't involve the word tales. Tales to Astonish is where Dr. Henry Pym made his debut in 1962, in a standalone story called The Man in the Ant Hill. It's sort of like a mini Twilight Zone episode where a scientist tests a new world-changing discovery on himself, only to face horrific consequences for his hubris. Hubris, it will get you every time. Pym regains his size without any fancy armor or helmets, although he does kick an ant's ass using, I shit you not, Judo. But in between this and his next appearance, something fantastic happened. The Fantastic Four, to be precise. After debuting two months earlier, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby's other creation had ushered in a new age of superheroes. So they decided to retool their incredible shrinking man to make him just a little more marketable. Hank had second thoughts about the whole, my discovery is too dangerous for humanity thing, and recreated his Pym particles just a few issues later. After his experience in the Ant Hill, Pym also developed a fascination with the insects and devised a cool chrome helmet that could communicate with them using electricity. It was still in the testing phases though, so he whipped up a colorful armored suit to protect him from bites, stings, and scratches. That was a lot scarier a second ago. That red and blue Ant-Man costume was what he wore when he met the love of his life, when he formed the Avengers, and when Garrett Morris played him on a super early episode of SNL. What the hell? But like any good scientist, Dr. Pym wasn't satisfied simply by shrinking. He wanted to push the limits of what his particles could achieve, and that means grow big or go home. Stan Lee was actually never a fan of Ant-Man because visually, unless you constantly drew him standing next to a matchbook or a Hot Wheels car or something for scale, he just looked like any other superhero. So Stan gave him a more spectacular power upgrade, a brand new identity, and a costume to match. Hank Pym has always had a chip on his shoulder, and his deep-seated feelings of inadequacy led him to further experiment with his size-changing particles. After he unlocked the ability to grow massive in size, If you two are finished comparing sizes... 65. 65. He gave himself a makeover and re-emerged as Giant Man. Keeping the color scheme from his Ant-Man costume, Pym ditched the bulky helmet for two wispy antenna sewn into his massive mask, just in case he felt like shooting the breeze with his old ant buddies. He eventually added a blue helmet and slick shoulder pads, but they didn't last long because as Hank continued to unlock the potential of Pym particles, he took on yet another identity. As Goliath, he achieved all new heights, but this phase marked the beginning of the end of Pym's mental health. He found himself unable to return to normal size, and that experience led him to making some extremely poor decisions. Namely, this ugly, ugly blue and yellow costume. Oh, and also creating the genocidal AI known as Ultron, who's responsible for the deaths of millions of people. Others would take up the Goliath mantle in the future, like Bill Foster, who's played by Lawrence Fishburne in the movie. I was partners with Hank on a project called Goliath. Though, no word on whether or not he's gonna be rocking that sweet, sweet ab window. Uh, I don't have abs, so I can't rock an ab window. What would you call it your window? <laughs> I would call mine the bread box. Uh, cause this just looks like a sweet potato roll. <laughs> there was also an evil version who'd eventually be known as Atlas, and even Hawkeye became Goliath for a hot minute because you gotta give Hawkeye something. But Hank had already moved on to the next and most controversial phase of his career, Yellow Jacket. 
After inhaling chemicals that induced symptoms of schizophrenia, Pym adopted an all new persona, one that incorporated both aspects of his powers, but at the cost of his sanity. Yellow Jacket was cocky, arrogant, and unstable, and while his new costume was cool to look at, it wasn't the most practical. Seriously, I dig the whole wing vibe thing that you're going for, but they can't be doing your peripheral vision any favors. You can't see anything left or right. That doesn't make any sense. You look like a, like a horse in Central Park. As Yellow Jacket, Pym's mental state continued to crumble until one day he hits his wife, Janet, and is rightfully expelled from the Avengers. After a lot of soul searching, Hank set up shop with the team's West Coast affiliate and traded in his costume for a gnarly red jumpsuit. It's not his most heroic look, but all those pockets were perfect for storing shrunken down weapons and vehicles. Pym eventually returned to his giant man garb, incorporating aspects from all of his prior costumes. More recently, he took up the mantle of the Wasp in honor of his wife, who, of course, wasn't actually dead in the first place. After she returned, Hank found himself merged with his worst creation, Ultron, and the last time we saw him, Pym's essence was trapped forever in the Soul Gem. I'm sure he'll escape eventually, but in the meantime, there have been plenty of other Ant-Men to keep us safe. Now, we've talked a lot about Hank Pym in this video, but unless you've been living under a rock, like maybe an ant, you know that the MCU Ant-Man is a completely different person, an engineer turned thief named Scott Lang. He first appeared in 1979, where he stole Hank's original Ant-Man suit in order to rescue the only doctor who could cure his daughter's illness. Aww. Pym was impressed by the thief's heroism and gave him his blessing to carry on the Ant-Man legacy. Lang wore Pym's classic costume for decades until a 2004 redesign introduced a new helmet that covered his face entirely. It didn't actually go over well with Ant fans, so when he joined the new Fantastic Four a few years later, he was back in a more traditional dark blue uniform. Finally, in 2015, Scott received one last makeover to bring his costume closer in line with the black and red look from the MCU. There's still one more man who wore the mantle, Eric O. Grady. This short-lived character was such a sharp contrast to his heroic counterparts. He was irrational, immoral, and irredeemable. O'Grady and his cool robotic ant-like suit didn't survive for too long, but even after his death, his life model decoy continues to stalk Earth-616 as the Black Ant. Time will tell if he'll ever appear in the MCU, but O'Grady would actually fit in quite well with Paul Rudd at the movies. Ant-Man's first appearance outside of comics was in 1966, as a part of a series of cheap cartoons that used barely moving comic panels in lieu of animation. He's a mainstay in pretty much any Avengers series, from the short-lived 90s show where everyone kind of dressed like a Power Ranger, to the amazing Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Come on, Buck! He almost received his own show in the 80s, but it would take something as game-changing as the MCU to truly shine a spotlight on Marvel's smallest hero. Since Tony Stark took the whole unleashing Ultron aspect of his character, Hank Pym was relegated to the role of old mentor, and Scott Lang became the star. From the very first test footage back when Edgar Wright was still directing, all the way through Civil War and Ant-Man and the Wasp, the MCU Ant-Man costume has been surprisingly consistent. Inspired by the suit worn by his deranged ultimate counterpart, the red lenses and fully enclosed helmet add a dose of practicality. The process is highly volatile. What isn't protected by a specialized helmet can affect the brain's chemistry. While the muted color scheme makes more sense for a scientist than the bright blues of the comics version, even if it leads Scott to mistaking it for some biker gear. What? An old motorcycle suit. Of course, it's a far cry from the war machine that is the MCU version of Yellow Jacket. Practical applications include surveillance, industrial sabotage, and the elimination of obstructions on the road to peace. So it's a suit. Don't be crude. Pym designed his Ant-Man suit as a scientific means to explore the quantum realm, but Darren Cross stole his tech to turn it into a weapon. The black and yellow mech suit looks like something out of Tony Stark's wet dreams.
but Lang was able to shrink it into oblivion, crushing Cross in the process. Ant-Man got an upgraded new suit in Civil War, which added a streamlined helmet, some gray accents in the material, and gave him the ability to increase in size. Holy shit! <laughs> okay, tiny dude is big now. He's big now. So far, he's shown no signs of changing his name or costume to match the giant man from the comics, but Ant-Man and the Wasp promises to pursue the potential of Pym Particles even further. Lang's new suit isn't the story here though, it's his new partner. So strap on your wings because next time on Yellow Spandex, we're going to be talking all about the Wondrous Wasp. It's about damn time. Thanks so much for watching everyone. I know that I'm hyped for the new Ant-Man movie and I can't wait for you to see our next episode about the Wasp. But until then, leave me a comment and let me know what your favorite Ant-Man incarnation is. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at NowNerdOfficial. Please subscribe to NowThisNerd. And if you see Ant-Man, good job, he's a little, he's a little tiny man.